Join us today for another Franchise Fixes, this time the uh, George Romero Zombie Movies. Welcome back to the Geek Cabal channel. I'm Bob. I'm Jim. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about the George Romero zombie movies, and maybe one or two of his other movies while we're at it. And, uh, yeah. This is, uh, you know, we're in October as we're filming this. It's probably going to be November before this, come, before this pops up, but, you know, not like zombies go away whenever November starts. They're kind of there forever. Well, the economy's bad, so we got zombies. That's right. That's why all those Walking Dead spinoffs are popping off right now. And by the way, I saw at least part of the Daryl Dixon one. wasn't bad. Need to go back and watch the uh, City of the Dead one, though. Because, you know, New York populated by zombies. It'd be entertaining. But anyway, uh, this is another installment of our Franchise Fixes videos, which I think we've only done two of up to this point. We have plans on some others. we got, like, big Star Wars plans. we just got to bring it all together. Uh, but yeah, this one's more of a, uh, like, a preemptive kind of go at it because this is like now that Romero Romero passed away several years ago and it's probably only a matter of time before someone gets most or all of the rights together somewhere and is like hey guys you know it would be really swell because we're creatively bankrupt here in Hollywood let's remake all those really awesome zombie movies George Romero made let's make them all hot commercial properties completely counter to what he tried to do because for those of you that don't know, the studios didn't back any of his movies. There was limited backing for Land of the Dead. That's it. The others were all, like, independently financed. Because he didn't want to have to answer to the studio people. Now, Land of the Dead, there were some aspects of it that were financed. That's why it's filmed in Canada. That's why there's actual stars in it. Uh, but other people weren't in it because they got cut because of the studio. So, you know. But it's got production value and stars, so... You know, you win some, you lose some, I guess. Uh, and also, it's because of this scattershot approach that Dawn of the Dead is not on any of the streaming services. And I mean the original one from the 70s, not the remake. The remake's perfectly fine. I like it. One of the few remakes that, like, is probably up there with the original. Uh, but it's not the same movie. And it's all because one guy owns the distribution rights and he's convinced that he's going to either be able to remake the movie or something. Uh, however, the upside to that is that that means he can't afford to troll YouTube constantly and take down other copies of the movie. So there are copies on here that have been up for like years. It's like it's the whole movie unedited. And at least one is uh, all of the parts of like the American version. The European version, combining the soundtracks for like the better moments for the songs, like it's like the ultimate version of the movie. Which even if they were streaming somewhere, you wouldn't be able to find this version. This is cobbled together by fans. And I watched it on YouTube one day. It's pretty good. Uh, so anyway, this is like I said, kind of like a preemptive, like say some word to the whole concept behind this. Our videos for this series is you somehow have acquired all the rights. You've got all the money you would ever need to make your dream come true. What would you do? Well, and kind of a, a beginning statement is I don't think a shot for shot remake, because I think that's just the money, that's just a cash grab for no real reason. If you're going to do that, just enhance the original film, make it yeah. look better, make it sound better, put it out there. Which, side note, you can legally do that with the original Night of the Living Dead. No one owns the rights to it. You find the unedited version out there. You can distribute it, you can add scenes to it, you can do whatever you want to it, and sell it. Which is why, if you ever see those like collections like, ah, oh, 50 horror movies for $10, it's in all of them. Because no one owns it. Um, but, you know, kind of, because uh, I, I had to kind of go back and get my bearings straight, because there's so many dead movies out there. Yeah, that... uh, to be crystal clear, Romero's movies, there are six of them. There's Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, Land of the Dead, Survival of the Dead, and I can't remember what the name of the last one is. 
I got, I got all of those. Um, Diary? Diary of the Dead. That's number six. Yeah, because, well, the Diary is 2007, Survival's 2009. Yeah, I mentioned Survival. I know, but I'm saying yeah. Survival's the, the end of the... No, it's, it's, it's not. Well, I mean, in the last one he... Yeah, it's the last one he produced, but Diary and... Sur- okay, so this is part of the problem, and this is why if someone were to remake these movies, they probably don't want to actually remake them as they are. Because chronologically, Night and Dawn and Diary all basically take place at the same time. And then, uh, or at least the beginnings of each of them do. And then Survival would be right after that. And then Land of the Dead and Day of the Dead are probably contemporary. Because they're several years Mm -hmm. after the zombie apocalypse has begun. But the others are all basically right at the beginning, with survival being just a little bit past it, like, you know, days or weeks. So, that's that's something to consider in the remake, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute. Well, and so one of the things, I mean, again, I, like I said, not, maybe these aren't fixes. Maybe this is just, like you said, a, a preemptive, you know, like, hey, think about these things, is one is that, um, the horror doesn't always have to come from, you know, like jump scares and stuff like that. Like when I look back at, you know, not, you know, night of the living dead, the fear came from the fact that you knew you were surrounded. It wasn't that, that that's a big part of it. Uh, but the other part of the fear of night of the living dead is who you're trapped in the house with. Yes. Yes. So, uh, Dawn of the Dead doesn't have that element. Dawn of the Dead is definitely the the other people that want in. Uh, then Day of the Dead is back to who you're stuck with. Uh, Land of the Dead is that's kind of all over the place. It's like don't let rich assholes take over again while you're surrounded by zombies. Well, and and I think those kinds of movies work well because I mean to me anything that's like post apocalyptic, kind of like the, even like the first Mad Max, which I know most people don't look fondly on because it's not, you know, desert wasteland Mad Max. It's still like there is civilization type. Yeah. Uh, I've actually seen a video that laid out that like, in all likelihood, the apocalypse has actually already happened in the first Mad Max movie. There's a bunch of signs and stuff in the background, like in the way things, like things are falling apart. Yeah. It's just that like the nuclear part hasn't quite hit Australia yet. Yep. Yep. Uh, and funny note on that is this is we we talk about always about how filmmaking has they film like half of that on like a shoestring budget and also like without getting permits to do half the you know half the shit they were planning on doing you know know. and that's not mel gibson's voice in most versions you see yeah voiceover although if you hear him now you would never know he was australian yeah no it's uh, (laughs) a but but anyways we're getting off track on that so one thing is is that i would not go in there and purposely make things like scary, whatever. I think grotesque is important because if you have people climbing out of the ground, you're going to have all sorts of levels of decay. Yeah. uh, That is kind of the one thing with the Romero zombies. They're mostly not people on the ground. I mean, to your point, like later, like in uh, Land of the Dead and Day of the Dead, since they're years later, yeah, those zombies are definitely falling apart. Uh, but even there, in the original Day of the Dead, the doctor in charge explains that like the rate of decay has massively slowed down. So it's going to take a decade for a zombie to become like a puddle of goo somewhere. Well, and the one thing I think they got right in that is that people shouldn't be able to just climb out of their tombs, like, like dig themselves out of the ground. I don't care if you're a zombie, you're not going through a casket and six feet of dirt. Right. Uh, because... That's another thing I believe that they, they need to make sure they always get right is that zombies should not have superhuman strength. It's yep. overwhelming numbers is right. what they're um which don't get me wrong, like Resident Evil has it had its place with their virus infected zombies, same thing with uh, World War Z, because it's something other than they're I mean, they're not technically zombies. They're I mean they they are dead, but they're somewhere in between. Oh no, the ones in World War Z are zombies. Because remember that scene towards the end of the movie where the doctor's explaining, like, look, it's a virus does this. He's like, but that thing right there is dead. We don't know how it's moving. Yeah. The virus did this to it, but it is no longer a living creature. But you, It's animated, but it's not living. 
and see, that's the thing is, I don't remember how Night of the Living Dead actually explains any of it. Ah, uh, it doesn't. And that's maybe that's fine. Uh, Night, of Living, Night of the Living Dead implies that it's a probe that's been on its way back from Venus that detected some unusual radiation, so they blew it up. But, you know, momentum still carried all the debris to Earth. And part of it landed in Pennsylvania, I think, and then the rest of it is just circling the globe, bathing the Earth in the radiation. That's why the movie takes place uh, in Pennsylvania, because that's where it starts. But eventually, the radiation just encompasses okay. everything. Now, that's, the, that's what they tell you in the first movie. Dawn of the Dead doesn't elaborate. Day of the Dead says that, no, that was wrong. We have no earthly idea what the hell's happening. So... And but still, like even the virus doesn't make a whole lot of sense because if if something's dead, and like don't get me wrong, there there are like human like if there's something that's trick you know triggering your adrenaline gland, I could see a boost in strength. But I think traditionally you use the overwhelming numbers. That's the, that's the big fear, um, not the um, you know not just like some crazy whatever. And right. you know, like you said, to your point, you know, you're not going to have as many decayed zombies so i think keeping that limited to just exceptions like say oh it was a morgue and there was like some burn victims and different things that came back yeah that would yeah, make sense it's, uh, it's it's the recently deceased because the brain still has to be intact okay so but once they become a zombie they're not falling apart unless you chop them apart like their the rate of decay is essentially stopped now admittedly that goes against everything we know about decay because, like, flies and the bugs and all that stuff would keep eating on them, and just bumping into things is going to cause cuts and lacerations, and flesh is going to fall off here, and that fun thing called winter is going to destroy most of them, you know. But zombie apocalypse doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, so it's best we don't even go down that route. Well, I can say the, the more likelihood would be some sort of viral thing that doesn't turn people into zombies, but turns them into, like... Crazy well, mushroom people? Yeah, exactly. Um, very similar to um, like some of the funguses that will take over insects and yeah, tell them pretty much go climb to the highest peak you can, and then I'm gonna sprout out of your head and yeah, travel my spores onto other people. Yeah, uh, actually, I wouldn't. I, that wouldn't be a bad way to go though. I think a fungal one would be. Well, oh, so you you probably played The Last of Us, but you probably didn't see the HBO show. Uh, no, the HBO show starts off really creepy. It's a uh, starts off like a TV interview, like back in the '60s, where they're talking about you know some super flu attacking things, which was really kind of funny given when it came out. You know, given given then current world events of the last couple of years, and so the other doctors on there, he's like, "Yeah, I don't think it's gonna be a super flu." He's like, eh, "Mankind bounces back from that. It won't kill all of us. Those of us that are still left alive will have immunity. We'll be just fine." You know, it'll do a number on the population, maybe, but humanity will continue. He's like, well, where is me? It's fungus. And the other doctor is, like, laughing. He's like, I know, I know. It can't take root in the human body because of our body temperature. And there's no evolutionary pressure to cause it to evolve today. He's like, well, what if, say, the global temperature increased? And then there was evolutionary pressure on the fungus to survive in a higher temperature. Well, then we're screwed because we have no defense against it. And it's just kind of like, hmm, gee, I wonder where this show's going. And, well, that's where it went. Although the, the opening to the second episode was better, though, whenever they figured it out what was happening. And uh, this is in, the, it's either India or like Kuala Lumpur, somewhere like that. And they bring this woman in, and she examines the body. And the moment she knows what it is, she tells them, like, the military's like, what do we do? She's like, bomb the city. They're like, what? She's like, we have no idea how many people are infected. We don't know how fast it's spreading. There's no way to stop it. You have to just bomb the city to obliterate it now. And, like, she drives home the point that she understands that, like, none of them can leave. She's like, if you would, could you take them to my family? Like, she's not even trying to advocate for her to be able to leave. And, like, that was kind of terrifying. And you find out in later episodes that, yeah, they tried that. It worked in a few places, but not enough. But anyway, uh, so if I think if you're going to remake the Romero movies, like I said, you have to take into account if you're going to try to comprehensively remake them. Take into account that, like, four of them essentially take place at the same time. Well, three of them do. One takes place very shortly afterwards. So I would probably actually make it a show 
but not an ongoing like The Walking Dead, because it's obviously going to be compared to that. Uh, and rightfully so, as I'll explain in a moment. But something like like an HBO series that has like 10 episodes, 12 episodes, something that could have a budget. doesn't need to be a huge budget, because zombie makeup isn't expensive, because AMC's done like 12 seasons of The Walking Dead. Uh, although I think the premiere of The Walking Dead is one of the highest rated television shows ever. So, what do I know? But uh, do it there. Like a, like a single season where you're going to have a story arc that's going to play out. And then have your initial episodes kind of interplay between the farmhouse part, the shopping mall part, and the kids from Diary of the Dead uh, who are out filming a horror movie in the woods when the fateful radio broadcast goes out that the bodies of the recently deceased are returning to life and, you know, Make your peace with God, because the apocalypse is here. Have have it have it cut between those episodes. Then at some point, you're going to make some stuff that takes place in between. And that's where you got to decide, are you actually going to have the survivors of these various episodes, like, band together, meet up, I think, or something. I would have them meet, but not necessarily stay together. And that's where you could also kind of play with the plot a little bit, like, say, uh, I personally favor the color remake of Night of the Living Dead, because Barbara is not just a useless bump on a log. So I would go with that approach where she escapes. Uh, and maybe actually have Ben actually survive this one. I would consider that. Uh, but have it so that one of the two of them definitely kills Harry, uh, the dad that's downstairs then maybe find out that one of the other characters is related to them. So you got some interpersonal drama there because you've got to keep the theme, the basic theme of the real monsters are the people, not the zombies. So maybe do something like that. Uh, definitely. The mall. I just don't know which one is the better approach because in the original, there's only four characters that go to the mall and two of them maybe escape. And you have the big motorcycle gang shows up. Whereas in the se- in the remake, you've got several more people. So you got a bigger cast and more of them escape, but they probably all die if you watch the end credits. So I would maybe fuse the two stories where you would have some people already there. The other people show up in the helicopter. And then the biker gang attacks and then a handful of them escape in the helicopter, and maybe some of the others escape with the shuttle bus and split them up, you know? Yeah, so there, there was... I was doing some looking up, because there was a, a, an idea that kind of came to mind for that. Um, and again, I don't know how well this would work for that, but it'd be a way of being able to tie everything to get them back, get them into one spot. And uh, that's... Um, I kind of figured out what the movie was called, but the movie was called Riot. Is about the L.A. riots, and it takes place from four perspectives. So you, it plays out from one perspective, and you don't notice at first because you're watching and you're like, okay, but you'll see people in the background, and then in the next perspective, it'll take place, and you, then you'll see the other people. You just, you know, you'll see yeah. from their perspective the yeah. other people. Yeah, I got you. Um, it's a very, and I mean, obviously, no, I mean, it's about the Rodney King, you know, riots and stuff, but. Um, it's a very interesting way of doing the filming because it's like four times. It's actually oh that uh, the um, vantage or vantage. I'm trying to think what the one's called. It's the one where it's a it's like an assassination where again it's like from like multiple different views. I think it's a kind of a neat idea. I'd like to see more films like that. Um, and th- actually, this would be a perfect thing where you could have four things going on simultaneously, and even hint at like. Like they, oh, they see some people running across this field or whatever, and then it yeah. flips to that group where they're like, "Hey, there's a house over there. We don't have time to make it," you know, kind of thing. And yeah, that would uh, that would definitely be one way to do it. Is maybe some of the people that make it to the mall, maybe have the farmhouse be. It's out in the country, but like five miles outside the city. Kind yeah. of thing. And like the people in the house might even talk about trying to make it into the city and be like, no, we can't do that. Cause some of them will have come from, come from the city and maybe they'll have 
almost yeah. intercepted at some point, but not quite. You know, they're like, they're like, they're like, oh, I see some people there. They may be, you know, but they may be zombies. You know, we can't, we can't be, can't yeah. be sure on it. Um, and then, uh, and then of course you have the, the X factor of the, the kids filming the movie and everything because they're trying to get back to school, which is presumably also at least close to the city. Yeah. And then maybe the farmhouse, maybe everything there goes bad. And one or two of them that survive actually do make it to the mall. And maybe they make it, maybe they make it before everything goes down or maybe they make it right as everything is going down and they see the people escaping and the zombies rushing in like, well, there goes that idea, you know? And then I would have whoever, whoever we decide is left. They'll be together. Once you get to the remaking of land of the dead and day of the dead, they'll either be in the city or at the military base. Assuming you've, approximate what happened in those movies and uh you'll have you'll actually be able to officially have the army guy that's in diary of the dead uh survival of the dead and land of the dead actually be the same guy because it's the same act there's one there's one actor that plays an army guy in all three of them but they're made by different studios so he has different names but it's like but it's clearly supposed to be the same guy yeah. you know well so I actually have actually have a story arc there for him you know, and then have, uh, you know, you have your land of the dead play out. Maybe some of the people that are part of the crew, if you, if you keep all the dead reckoning and all that stuff, maybe some of them are the people that have escaped that we know are like hard boiled types that have been surviving for years now against the zombie hordes are on board there. Maybe they're the ones who are causing trouble against whoever's, you know, in control of the the rich part, you know, things like that. So the, the, my big takeaway on a lot of this is that one is there shouldn't be a message. I mean, the mess there are mess there can be things like well, people are evil and people are going to do what they well, have to to survive. I, I, I would if this is a huge if because I don't think the writers in Hollywood are capable of this anymore. But if he could find ones that knew how to actually incorporate the message without just being ham fisted about it, then I would try to keep it. Because, like, like for Dawn of the Dead, the message is that uh, consumerism is bad. Because in both of them, they can never figure out why everyone's coming back to the mall. And the best theory they can come up with is because it was important to them. Of all the things in their life that was important to go to, it's to go spend money on useless crap. Like, that's a message. But it's not like, you know, we don't have uh, Damon Wayans there. Like, in uh, Don't Be a Menace. Yeah. Message, you know. Yeah. No, no. Well, I mean, but that's what I'm saying is that it, that shouldn't be the, the primary focus. It should be. Yeah, no, I mean, the around. primary focus should be that and the, be, the people are the villains. Well, yeah, I know. And that, I mean, that could be the message is that when it comes down to survival, people are going to do what it takes to survive. They're going to be less inclined to look out for their fellow, you know, yeah. fellow humans and stuff like that. And that is a message in its own. But that's the kind of message that should be told. It shouldn't be, you know. Because I don't want it, I don't, I don't want it to go down to be a political thing. I don't want it to go down to be a. Oh yeah, no, it should. There, there should. In the zombie apocalypse, political parties aren't going to matter anymore. You know, well, that's. I mean, technically, Resident Evil is a political thing. I mean, it's the government. It's, you know, just make it something supernatural. Make it something that is, you know, I, I would out I would, of the realm of us to control. I would stick with not explaining it. Exactly, yeah, having theories. And maybe put and maybe one of the theories is correct that the producers know it's correct, but that the characters in the movie don't know it's correct. You know, like uh, I think it's The Walking Dead, if I remember correctly. Like Kirkman, Kirkman knows what the genesis of everything is. The characters don't. The characters never will. But Kirkman needs to to make everything work. You know. Yeah, and I think keeping the budget low. Yeah. I, I don't think you want a huge budget on it because, I mean, like I said, we were talking about our podcast earlier because uh, when we filmed this, we filmed it after our podcast. But um, you film it somewhere like Detroit where you don't even have to pay to. <laughs> to... And <Yeah>, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, well, it, there could be a lot of places. You won't even notice you're filming a zombie movie. <laughs> that's just Tuesday, guys. I like, well, is that an extra? No, that's just a. <laughs> That's <laughs> just a guy walking down the street. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the meth addict. Uh, 
But no, I mean, there's there's lots of things. I mean, there's lots of abandoned towns. Find one. Yeah. Film there. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I mean you, we you could definitely, you could definitely, do it. And, and the nice thing is, you could probably actually find a lot of them in Pennsylvania where these were originally filmed. Because like, that's definitely a Rust Belt state. Like, there's got to be all kinds of rundown stuff all over Pennsylvania. Yeah, and, you know... You could even go to the, the town that inspired Silent Hill. Yeah. The, like, the three buildings that are left in it. With the coal mine that constantly burns. Yes, that they can't put out. Yeah. Yes. They're like, oh, we're going to burn this stuff off. Whoops. And now the fire's been going for, like, 50, 40, 40... Yeah, they, yeah, they, they revoked the town's zip code. Okay? Like, <laughs> I don't know what you have to do to do that, other than, like, there not be a town left. But uh, they did it before there was not a town left. No. But yeah, yeah, definitely keep the budget low. Uh, I don't even know. Aside from the zombies, hell, even dead malls are even but even easy to find there because you go. Uh, that's a whole genre in itself. The whole dead mall series. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, you you've got that because like because okay because Night of the Living Dead takes place on a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. You find a dead shopping mall. The underground base doesn't even have to be underground. But I would say. Do that. Keep a you know mo- modest budget. Keep it practical. Take out any that you don't need CGI. Don't uh, don't do like the World War Z where the, they can open their mouth like three or four extra no. inches. No. Don't or that, actually, I'm thinking I Am Legend. That's the one that they did that on. Ah, I may have done on the World War Z too, but I Am Legend. Yeah, you know, don't do that. Um, you know, oh, I yeah. say I say that because we mentioned in one where. Uh, they see, do CGI blood a lot of times because they can remove it for other markets. No, if you're going to do that, spend the money there to digitally remove the practical blood. Yeah. No. I ideally you'd get like Tom Savini for your effects. Uh, I don't know if he still does stuff. He's getting up there in age, but you know, it'd be nice if he did that and come back for a cameo. Uh, if not him, then see if you can get Greg Nicotero to walk away from The Walking Dead for a little bit to do different zombies. But I don't know if he can do that. Maybe. Walk from that dead to this dead. Yeah. Uh, uh, which, because of tax purposes, this will probably also be filmed in Georgia. Well, you know, I I mean, I, I guess, but, um, but no, like I said, that, um, keep it practical, and, um, yeah, I mean, try to go with uh, zombies and stuff that fit what was originally... Yeah. And yeah. I would, okay, the, the other thing is, uh, if we're going for the message of, you know, people are the problem, you have to do it in a different way than what has happened in a couple times on The Walking Dead. Because uh, I haven't seen the last few seasons, but I have seen one of the clips from them where Maggie's going on about Negan killing Glenn, which, you know, it's her husband, and, Glenn and Negan beat him to death with a baseball bat right in front of her, so, you know. I don't understand why she took that personally. And Negan points out, like, yeah, that was right after he killed, like, 75 of my guys totally unprovoked. Like, they had families. Like, I was their leader. I was doing what you would have done in my place. Like, Maggie, have you ever considered that I'm not the bad guy? That you're not the bad guy? That there is no bad guy? We're all doing what we can to survive? You know... So just don't copy that speech. You know, yeah. find another way to do it. Uh, that would definitely be important. Then I would maybe actually take some stuff from two of Romero's other movies and just throw them in as a nice nod, because he did one movie called The Crazies, which was remade, which was remade ten years ago, I think. Um, the government accidentally releases this chemical that causes everyone to go crazy. So, like, have that happen towards the beginning. And, like, they try to blame that, but then it's like, no, that was just some other thing, you know? Is the total red herring. Uh, Governments don't release stuff into the general public. What are you talking about? Well, in the remake, it was very clear it was a weapon. And, like, I don't think they did it on purpose, but they charted what happened so they knew what to do with it. And then also, the movie Martin is about this kid who's convinced he's a vampire, like a 200-year-old vampire, so he goes to live with his uncle who's convinced he's a 200-year-old vampire. And, like, his uncle's like, I'm going to beat the demon out of you kind of scenario. And the kid definitely, like, drinks some women's blood at various points in the movies. Movie. And uh, I think at the end, his uncle killed him with a stake through the heart. I don't think he was actually a vampire, though. I said that would kill you, though. But anyway, like, you know, get a, get a character of approximate 
right age, name them Martin, have them show up, maybe have them crazy in the head thinking they're a vampire too. Just a, a nod to Romero's other movie. The one fewer people have seen. I'm not going to go into the one where it's basically like, here's Dementia the movie. That was creepy. You don't want to get into Knight Rider, which I only seen the cover of when I was re- researching this. Guys which, in medieval armor riding motorcycles? Yes. I've never watched it, but... Sounds like something I need to watch, though. But yeah, uh, just overall, com- combine the three movies that take place at the same time, the fourth one that's just a little bit later, and fill in to lead to the other two, and then build to some kind of climax where everything comes together. And that's why I think the better approach is an episodic approach over like 10 to 12 hour long episodes of a show. And just, just, it just, it's just the one season, you know, and at the end, I would probably have it be similar to the end of land of the dead where it's like, okay, now where do we stand? The zombies are smart and we can't really do certain things to them to defeat, to defeat them anymore. The evil rich assholes defeated. The city's not quite safe for us anymore, and these guys are going to drive off in the super tank, and everyone's just kind of going to go their own ways and hope it all pans out. And that's what I would do. That, that's how the zombie movies end, because the zombies aren't going to stop. So it's literally just going to be, here's the end point. Maybe they make it, maybe they don't. And along the way, most of the characters will die. Yes, you can have... I agree, and I think it should just stop at that point, you know, because the other thing is is that people are like, well, no, 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 it's got to keep continuing on. It's got to keep continuing on. and You know, in some aspects, I can see that when there's material and stuff. Um, but again, the same thing we run into, all the other topics we talk about, especially Star Wars, is that they have all these stories to tell. They're just not, you know, they're just not doing a very good job at telling them. Yeah. They're not mean, to, oh, my big one was, Keep people human. Like, make them do things, make decisions that actual people would make. People try to put all of this, like, you know, heroics and all this stuff in there when nine times out of ten people, self-preservation is going to kick in and they're going to be, like, pushing people down to... Yeah, that's that's one of the things about the original Night of the Living Dead. Like, Harry in the basement comes across as an asshole, and he is an asshole. You can tell he's probably he probably beats his wife or something. He, he definitely yeah. has that vibe. But at the same time, he's like, "I'm not dying because you people are stupid. Like, let's barricade ourselves in. Like, it's a stupid plan. I and on the whole, but it makes sense from an irrational fear standpoint because, like, we barricade the store, they can't get in. We'll be safe. The authorities will handle things. Well, we've seen the movie, so we know that like the authorities don't handle things ultimately. But that's the kind of thing someone would think in that situation. And like his wife's down there, his daughter's been injured, you know, he's trying to make sure they're safe. And so like his actions make sense. Yeah. It's just, he's an asshole. Just like Ben's actions also make sense. Cause Ben's seeing the bigger picture of like, I don't want to be boarded up down there because there's one way in and out then and we'll be screwed if we get swarmed because we won't be able to get back out. And they might be able to break the door down, in which case we have no way out. And in the original, Barbara's like comatose for most of the movie, so she doesn't do much. But in the se- in the remake, Barbara's the one who's like, you know, guys, we can walk right past these things. They are so damn slow. We need to do it now before we get swarmed. We could make it. And it's Ben who's the compassionate one. Is like, well, what about Cooper and his daughter? Like, we definitely can't take his daughter. And she's like, they can board up in the basement. We'll go get help and come back. Yeah, because more than likely them leaving would maybe funnel the, you know... The yeah, zombie. yeah. Well, the, the, the remake is full of all kinds of ironies at the end. Uh, Cooper's daughter turns into a zombie because she was bit. Uh, kills the wife. Comes upstairs. And then Cooper won't shoot her because it's his daughter. Well, Ben shoots her because he's like, it's a zombie, you know? Well, then Cooper shoots Ben, and they have a shootout there at the zombie corral, basically, because, like, the zombies are pouring in at this point. And Barbara takes the gun and just runs for it. And Cooper goes upstairs, which he was adamantly against. That was like Ben's fallback plan. And he figures out that there's an attic with a drop-down thing, and so he goes up and pulls the cord up so the zombies can't get up there. And Ben ends up down in the basement, because that's the only place left to go. And the door holds. The house fills full of zombies, and they never break the door down. 
the next morning, Barbara comes with like a bunch of uh, hillbillies that she's come across who are just going through the countryside shooting all the zombies. And they make it there, and they have to chainsaw their way through the door because of the barricades. Well, because Ben got shot, he bled out, so he's a zombie. And so they shoot him. Cooper comes downstairs like, oh, you made it back. Barbara shoots him. And the hillbillies like, damn. Like, totally ignoring the fact she just killed somebody. They clearly had to have heard him say something, and they're just like, well, fuck with her. <laughs> but the irony of ironies was they were looking for this key for the gas pump. And as Ben locks himself in, he has to shoot the wife because she's become a zombie. He's getting ready to light his cigarette. And by the light, he looks over just on the wall. and There's the key to the gas pump. And he just laughs his ass off as he bleeds to death. Because two people died because of that. So, because they couldn't find the keys to the gas pump. And the hillbilly guy that with one and two brides like, I'll just shoot the lock off with my shotgun. Well, he does, but it shatters the handle of the pump and gas sprays all over the truck and there was a burning torch in the back and kaboom. Then the zombies got to eat fried people. Because you see them dragging the bodies out and eating them. Uh, and that's that's another thing that the show will definitely have to it would have to emphasize is that like the zombies will eat anything that's warm blooded. It's not just people. No animals. Yes. Now the other things don't turn, but they will eat them. because uh, like in remake you see him like pulling like mice up and eating them and worms and everything else wasn't well, in one of the ones where they were trying to get them to eat in survival of the dead they were trying to get them to eat uh something else like a horse or something instead of the people and it actually succeeded at the very end you know but it should have worked all along romero should remember his own rules uh because like the walking dead you see him eat a horse a couple times uh or at least once anyway and then in Day of the Dead, it comes back. The alligators in Florida are just fine. They're cold-blooded. Plus, they're probably eating the zombies because they prefer dead things anyway because they, you know, they can crush with their jaws, yeah. but they can't chew. So they just drag them under, do the death roll, and except, you know, they don't die. They just keep pulverizing them so they can eat them. Unlike Zombie 2, where a zombie fights a shark and wins. Starts take, just starts tearing chunks out of the shark. But, uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, take advantage of the fact, you know, incorporate the three stories that all happen simultaneously. Add some characters, you know, do some new stuff. And then have your fill in before you get to like Land of the Dead. Because that's like five or ten years later. You know, have, have a time skip in between there to like some intermediate point. And then tie... Land of the Dead and Day of the Dead together have the army base be an outpost for the city because both of those movies talk about other outposts that they're connected to. In Land of the Dead, they're talking about they're it's supposed to be in Pittsburgh, if I remember correctly, and uh, even though it's filmed in Canada, they uh, they're hoping no one notices because no one's been to Pittsburgh or Canada. So they, uh, <laughs> well, that's like Romeo must die. That's not. Uh, Wherever it is in California, that's filmed like Toronto or something. I don't think it's Toronto; it's somewhere in Canada. Anyway, this good, is this good movie though. This is filmed in the same place. Uh, anyway, uh, they you know both of those movies talk about having outposts, so make the military base an outpost of the city, so that whenever everything goes sideways in the military outpost, then the city's obviously going to stop hearing from them. We, the audience, will know what happened. Probably no one's going to make it to the city unless the people that escape at the end of the helicopter go to the city, but they were more inclined to go to an island. Which, there you could wrap that back around to if you incorporate that part from the remake of Dawn of the Dead, where we know the islands are in fact completely overrun with zombies, and they're just going to their doom. So did the zombies just walk their way to the island? There was already, some, there was already people. Because there was a boat dock and everything. They just didn't expect it like there was people, and there was a lot of people, and they're all dead now. Because, yeah, the, the credits to the Dawn of the Dead remake are pretty good. Uh, they find a boat, because they take off on a boat. They find a boat with a cooler, and they open it up, and there's a zombie head inside. They're trying to bite him. It's just one of those, like, what the hell's the story here? Which, by the way, we could put that in there. That'd be interesting. And then they make it to the island, and, like, the dog jumps off and runs up the dock. And then you hear all this noise, and you just see this horde of zombies coming at him. And it stops right as they're, like, right there. 
and then it's just a bunch of flashes of zombies tearing people apart as Down with the Sickness starts playing. So, which we've been treated to early in the movie as the Las Vegas Lounge Singer Edition. And I was just thinking that if they did go onto an island, that you could do a uh, a almost remake shot of uh, uh, the first Pirates of the Caribbean where um, oh. Barbosa's crew is yeah. just walking on the ocean floor. Well, I mean, like I said, there's... If we, if we go outside the Romero movies, there's precedence in, uh, it's called Zombie or Zombie 2, uh, because Dawn of the Dead was called Zombie overseas. Yes. And so this one's called Zombie 2, even though it takes place before, because it has an explanation for the zombies. They're voodoo zombies. Because the very beginning of the movie, this boat from the Caribbean comes up, the New York cops go on board, there's a zombie on board, it bites one of the cops... And then goes overboard. And I was watching this with my cousin. I told him, I was like, I was like, the end of the movie, I'm telling you, right there, we just saw the beginning of the zombie apocalypse right there. That cop's going to die. He's going to turn. That one of the water's going to pop back up somewhere. And sure enough, the end of the movie, a few people make it away from the Caribbean. And they finally like get within range of radio signals of New York. And the radio's telling them, avoid New York. Do not come here at all. Like, zombies have overrun the island. And uh, Which they clearly haven't, because they're walking across the Brooklyn Bridge on the footpath. And there's traffic going both ways. Yeah. Good luck on trying to shut that down. <laughs> now, speaking of that, though, like what they did in uh, 28 Days Later, they just had to find the right time to film. Yeah. It was like real or it was like 5 in the morning on Sundays and stuff like that. Yeah. They, they, but my gosh, they, they got it done, and it looks yeah. it, it makes that movie so much better because they did it that way. Now, we're at the point where we can start filming 28 years later. Are we? Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I, w- I would also hope for, like in Shaun of the Dead, there's a montage at one point on the, sc- on the TV where they're talking about like what it might have been. And they even talk about rage-infected monkeys at one point. Like, I would hope that like, someone, like, there's a shout-out to that as an acknowledgement or, or a, a super virus released by a corporation, you know. Not quite. It's 2002, so we're at 21. Yeah, we're getting there. We're getting close. We're going to have 28 years later. I mean, we get Cillian Murphy to come back. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so overall, that's the way I would go about it. I would not do it piecemeal as various movies because there's already been a remake of Night of the Living Dead, and it's really good. Tom Savini was the one who made it. It's a color remake. came out in the 90s. has uh, Tony Todd in it as the main character. Well, as Ben and Patricia Tallman. Uh, for those of you that watch Babylon 5, she was Lita Alexander. And uh, that's the only other thing I know she's in. Then, uh, then there's the remake of Dawn of the Dead, which was did absolute success at the box office and was really good. But, uh, yeah, the other movies have not been remade. That's because three of them were too recent. Because uh, no one's, like, beating down the door to remake Diary of the Dead. Or um, Survival of the Dead. Yeah. I think Diary of the Dead is the better of the two, especially when they come across the Amish farmer who's mute. So they're trying to, they're in like a Winnebago, trying to find some place to pull over so they can do some repairs. And like, oh, we'll pull in this barn. They pull up and there's a guy, Aah! and they're like, shoot him. He's like, no, hang on. He's like, writing something on the board, like, can't talk. <laughs> and then he's like, friends? And points behind him, there's a whole bunch of zombies. He's like, oh, God. And then he turn around, he's got a stick of dynamite. <laughs> so they bring him in there. Ah, uh, but as they're all about to leave, a zombie bites him. He's got his scythe in his hand and just like <laughs> through his head and through the zombie. It's like, damn. I was kind of hoping he was going to make it. He wasn't going to contribute much to conversation, but, but yeah. I'm telling you, you still need to put on your list the uh, uh, the Horde, the French zombie film that I talk about. You know, I haven't seen that one, but I did watch a Canadian zombie film. That clearly was like from Quebec. It was all in French, and that was uh, that was interesting because I think like they didn't spell it out, but I think like the area they were in had been cordoned off by the military, and so like I think the outside didn't know what was happening, and uh, yeah, the zombies were everywhere. They were weird. Well, supposedly it's available on Tubi. I'll have to see if it's on there. If it is, but. Uh, there's this guy that's like walking around like a soldier and I guess he's just like oblivious to what's happening and keeps like jump scaring people. And so, well, the third time he does it, they've just, they just explained to this one woman how to use a shotgun. And they're like, 
if you hear a growl, shoot it. And he's like, ha! And she's, <laughs> <laughs> and she's just like, oh my god, that was a real person. <laughs> and the guy like that's dealt with him a couple times goes up like, yeah, he's not. And he's like, yeah, he was infected. You did the right thing. <laughs> Trying to ease her conscience, you know. And the other one was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, somebody sneezes and yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's like in uh, um, Zombie Land, you know. Bill Murray's dressed up as a zombie and goes and surprises one of them. And it's like, well, in hindsight, this was a bad idea. After he gets shot in the chest, yeah. I mean, there's there's things you just don't do in the zombie apocalypse. Jump scares is one of them. Oh, Bill Murray. Yeah. <laughs> Where he was dressed up in the zombie gear and they're like ah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. So I mean that's that's my idea. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments, because I think we're probably pretty well done here. So uh you know if you liked all this, like, share, subscribe, let us know about other franchises you want us to talk about, where we would try to go in and fix things. What what do you think is broken about them? Are there others like this where there's really nothing to fix, but you know someone's going to try at some point. Like, we all know at some point, Disney is going to get the insane idea to remake the original trilogy. Like, you know it's going to happen. Like, it will happen at some point. We all know this. And the only possible good that can come out of that is if they actually make 1 through 6 a little bit more cohesive. That's the only good that can come out well, of it. I say the only thing they could really fix on the prequels, I would say, is less CGI. Yeah, maybe. And, you know, the, uh, and then just scrap the sequels. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking more like, kind of like what we talked about, like inserting Ahsoka, things like that, you know, at, yeah. least, at least mentioning her in Revenge of the Sith, you know, things like that. Like, I, I would get behind that change if they wanted to do that now. Or an extended cut, I could see an extended. Yeah, like if they wanted to do that now and do and do it convincingly, doing it well, get the original actors back, and uh, get the girl that played her in the the younger one in the Ahsoka series, you know. But that's but, a but, that, you, but you've got to do it now because she's she's not getting any younger. And that's a topic for a oh, yes, other yes, day. To- totally other topic there, but just throwing it out there. Uh, so yeah, you know that's where we stand on that. So you know, like, share, subscribe if you liked what you heard. Send us your comments. Uh, and yeah, even even if you're like, how dare you say it needs to be fixed? And by no means do we ever say it needs yeah, to be fixed. We're not it's, saying it needs to be fixed. We're saying once someone finally decides to fix it, here's some suggestions. So, yeah, because like, because I would never advocate for like fixing aliens or alien. You know, because yeah. we've talked about that. The only fix I would make is put in the deleted scenes. That's it. Yes. Hey, if they want to keep putting it, doing that, and put, re-release it in theaters, I'd go watch it. Yeah, for sure. So, anyways, uh, I think that's all that we have on the topic. So, I believe so. Uh, until the next, uh, our next franchise fixes, whenever that'll be. Yeah, well, we got to find some other franchise that needs fixing. So, all right, all right. Well, thank you, folks, for watching, and uh, yeah, watch out for the zombies. Remember, aim for the head, double right. tap. Yes. Thank you.